All right, guys, Dominic here for Kit Guru, and there's no doubt about it, we have seen a huge growth in the number of proper HDR monitors on the market over the last few years, particularly with the rise of OLED and mini LED screens. Such monitors are usually very, very good, but typically come at a massive cost. We're talking close to a thousand pounds, if not more. So they've not exactly been ready for the mass market. Cooler Master is hoping to change that, however, with the GP2711, and this is a mini LED monitor with 576 dimming zones on offer for £380 here in the UK. It sounds very interesting on paper, so today we're going to find out exactly how good this monitor is. Alongside its HDR capabilities, the Cooler Master GP2711 offers a VA panel with a quantum dot layer, promising very wide gamut support. It also offers a claimed 3000 to 1 contrast ratio, 165Hz refresh rate, and a rated 4 millisecond gray to gray response time. All of that in a monitor that retails for £379 here in the UK certainly sounds like a very attractive deal on paper, but of course we've got plenty of testing to go over in this video to find out whether or not it can live up to its promise. I'm going to start things off with a look at the design however, and if you've seen any of Cooler Master's monitors over the last couple of years, then you will be familiar with what the GP2711 can offer. That is definitely a good thing though, as it features a very sleek profile with a bezel-less design and a fairly subtle chin that only measures in about 15mm thick. It's also great to see that Cooler Master has kept the metal stand. It feels nice and sturdy in the hand and definitely adds a premium feeling that you don't always get from some monitors that are far more expensive than the GP2711. Cooler Master also makes a point of the heatsink design used here, which it claims can reduce operating temperatures by 5 degrees while also extending product durability by 30%. Now, of course, I have no way of testing those claims, but the immediate benefit is the GP2711 does not have a fan, despite reaching very high levels of brightness in HDR, as we will see later in this video. So, again, that for me is an immediate positive. The included stand also offers the full array of ergonomic adjustments, including height adjust up to 110 millimeters. We get 15 degrees of swivel both left and right. There's tilt from 5 degrees downwards to 20 degrees upwards, and we even get full pivot functionality, so the screen can be rotated 90 degrees. And finally, VESA 100x100 100 100 mounts are supported if you want to attach a third-party bracket or monitor arm. Ports and connectivity are also reasonable with one DisplayPort 1.4 and two HDMI 2.0. We also find a Type-C port that supports DP alt mode, as well as 15 watts of power delivery. Then we find one audio jack and a two-port USB hub, while KVM functionality is also supported. Finally, a power button and OSD joystick are the only buttons found anywhere on the display, and these are on the back in the bottom right corner. As for the OSD itself then, this is split into six main tabs, and honestly, I don't have any real complaints here. It's nice and quick to navigate with that joystick. Things are sensibly laid out, and it includes all the key features that I would like to see. My only real piece of feedback is that it would be good to be able to change the OSD shortcuts, which isn't currently possible, but otherwise the OSD is pretty painless. If you're looking for a new chair, then you should definitely check out Boolies. I'm currently sat on their Ninja Pro gaming chair, which is one of three models from their gaming series alongside the Elite and the Master. So if you're looking for something new to stick in your setup that you can sit on and game and work, then I recommend definitely checking out boolies.co.uk. That's going to do it though for our look at the design of the monitor and it's now time to move on to talk about panel performance. Here we are using our updated testing methodology thanks to Portrait Display's Kalman Ultimate software and if you do want to read more about this you can find it on our website. Kicking off our testing then with brightness and contrast we find a reasonable if not mind-blowing range on offer. Full screen white luminance drops as low as 51 nits and goes as high as 308 nits, though that is some way short of Cooler Master's claimed 600 nit brightness in STR, but more on that in just a minute. The good news is that black levels are nice and low as we would hope from a VA panel, resulting in contrast around the 4200 to 1 mark, which is better than even what Cooler Master claims. 
Now, just then, I did mention that out of the box, this monitor falls well short of Cooler Master's claimed 600 nits brightness for the GP2711. And as it turns out, there's actually a setting in the OSD called Max Brightness, and enabling this unlocks higher levels of screen brightness. Why isn't this enabled by default, you ask? region-specific energy efficiency regulations according to Cooler Master, as of course, higher brightness equals higher power draw. Still, with the max brightness mode enabled, we saw a peak of 598.7 nits, so pretty much 600 nits as per Cooler Master's claims. The only downside is that black levels are ever so slightly raised with this setting enabled, and that reduced contrast to about 3660 to 1, but it's really not a major concern. It's also worth saying here that it is actually possible to engage local dimming in SDR, and while I am still fine-tuning the test methodology for full array local dimming screens, initial testing suggested a contrast ratio of over 300,000 to 1 with local dimming enabled, so you can significantly improve on the native contrast ratio with those 576 dimming zones. Moving on though, given the GP2711 does feature a quantum dot layer, we naturally find a very wide color gamut on offer, far exceeding the sRGB space and delivering 97% DCI-P3 and 95.3% Adobe RGB coverage. Rec 2020 reporting is also healthy with 74.9% of that color space, not bad at all for a £380 monitor. As for grayscale testing, out of the box, the GP2711 delivers reasonable results, but it does have a noticeably warm tint with an average correlated color temperature of 6079K. Still, a grayscale average delta E of 2.84 is decent, as is gamma tracking, averaging 2.244. Now, I also tweaked the color balance via the user mode, reducing the red bias and the red gain settings from 50 to 49, and that did result in a much more even color balance, now with an average CCT of 6463K. Grayscale Delta E was a touch higher, however, at 3.06, likely due to the now slightly green tint. As expected though, given the very wide color gamut on offer, we do see a fair amount of oversaturation relative to the sRGB color space. Relative to DCI-P3, however, saturation is improved to an average delta E of 2.22, which is acceptable, but perhaps not mind-blowingly good. Of course, that oversaturation does lead to relatively poor color accuracy when targeting the sRGB space, with an average delta E of 4.76. Thankfully, there is an sRGB emulation mode which we test in a minute, but we also test color accuracy relative to the DCI-P3 space, and again, this is improved with an average delta E of 2.81, though that's still not amazing out of the box. Speaking of the sRGB emulation mode, however, with the GP2711, this does a decent job, effectively clamping the color space to expected levels, particularly reducing the red, green, and cyan channels, where we saw high levels of saturation out of the box. Grayscale is unchanged, however, with the red tint remaining. Thankfully, it is still possible to adjust color balance settings in the sRGB emulation mode, which not all monitors support, but this mode alone won't guarantee great results. Saturation is also improved with the sRGB mode enabled compared to default settings with a new delta E of 1.7. Color accuracy also sees improvements to good levels, this time with a new average delta E of 1.93. The white and lighter gray shades are still not overly accurate, however, due to the reddish color balance, but overall, Cooler Master has done a decent job with this sRGB emulation mode. Of course, for the best results, a full calibration is required, which we achieved using Kalman's Ultimate software. This delivered near perfect grayscale and gamma tracking, while the saturation and overall color accuracy, average delta E's dropped to very impressive numbers. The final area I want to look at then is going to be viewing angles, which are okay, but there is a definite loss of saturation when viewed from a side angle, but considering this is only a 27 inch display, it's not a huge concern. Moving on now then to response times. Here we're using the open source response time tool as developed by Tech Team GB, and we're testing all five of the overdrive modes found within the OSD for the GP2711 at the native 165 hz refresh rate. Starting with native panel performance then with overdrive turned off, we see very slow response times across the board with an average response time of 14.25 milliseconds. Engaging the normal overdrive mode speeds things up to 10.83 milliseconds on average, but that is still a very slow response time 
particularly in the rise times from dark shades as evident on the top row, which is unfortunately all too common with VA panels. The advanced overdrive mode is another bump faster, but again, it's still pretty slow by modern standards with an average gray to gray response of nine milliseconds. It's also starting to introduce some overshoot, but really nothing terrible. Then we come to the ultra fast mode, which is of course the fastest with an average response time of 6.66 milliseconds. But even then, it's still what I'd only describe as average. That's also not taking into account the high levels of overshoot with 40% of transitions now exceeding their target by 10 RGB values or more. Interestingly, there is one final overdrive mode labeled dynamic. This seems to do a reasonable job at providing a single overdrive experience as we tested it at 165 hertz, 120 hertz, and 60 hertz. It's by no means perfect as the response times from the GP2711 are not great with any overdrive setting, but it does strike an acceptable balance across the refresh range. However, the snag is that the dynamic overdrive mode is only available when adaptive sync is disabled. It is simply grayed out when adaptive sync is enabled, and that is a real shame. Most people will want a game with adaptive sync enabled, and in doing so, you lose the option of having a single overdrive mode. As it is, I'd personally recommend using the advanced overdrive mode if you can keep the frame rate above 100 FPS, but below that, the overshoot does become a bit too noticeable, and you'll likely get a better experience with the normal overdrive mode. For a visual representation then, here we can see the pursuit camera images using the Blurbusters UFO test. Even with the OD dynamic and ultra fast modes, there is just too much image trailing. This is another case of a VA panel exhibiting dark level smearing, regardless of the overdrive mode used. We can also see that the ultra fast mode does introduce some bright overshoot artifacts, particularly evident in the bottom row. For an example of how the GP2711 compares to a decent IPS monitor, here we can see it side by side with the AOC Q24 G2A, and, and that's a budget screen that only costs about £200, but it does offer a notably clearer image with little ghosting or smearing. As for all that means in terms of real world gaming then, unfortunately a lot of the time you are going to notice a high amount of blurring or smearing particularly from any darker elements on screen and this is all due to the dark level smearing that is inherent to some va panels this is something i noticed when driving around forza horizon 5 at night and i also saw it when playing one of the introduction missions in cyberpunk 2077. of course for slow paced games it's not going to be as big of a factor I personally always like to try out LEGO Builder's Journey on any new monitor I test, and this really benefits from the GP2711's wide gamut and high levels of saturation, giving it a very punchy and vibrant image, but there is simply no getting away from the fact that the response times are a real limitation for this monitor. It is worth pointing out though that despite not being officially G-Sync compatible certified, I had no issues with adaptive sync enabled when tested with my RTX 4090. There was no flickering even when in HDR and that has been a problem for previous Cooler Master monitors but not so for the GP2711. Speaking of HDR, it's time to talk about what is probably the biggest selling point for this monitor, starting with the levels of brightness that can be achieved in HDR. Cooler Master claims a peak of 1500 nits, but I actually hit 1604 nits at a 10% APL. Brightness does tail off at smaller window sizes with a 1% APL delivering 992 nits, but that is still very impressive for a relatively budget HDR screen. Full screen brightness is also a rather eye searing 1145 nits, which is one area where we see a clear advantage to mini LED versus OLED, considering OLEDs can't typically sustain full screen brightness above 250 nits. As for grayscale, you may have seen some previous reviews of the GP2711 that demonstrated very dark EOTF tracking, but with the latest firmware, which is version 1.05, I am pleased to say that this is now fixed and the EOTF tracking is generally accurate, being just a touch too bright for the lower midtones. We do still see a warm tint overall, particularly when looking at the brighter shades, but a user color balance is still an option when HDR enabled, which is great to see. Overall color accuracy is reasonable in HDR2. Here we're going to show figures with and without luminance error, but in both cases, we're looking at an average delta E of below three, so that is not a bad result. 
The main offenders are the 100% cyan and 100% green channels, which the GP2711 can't accurately display, as it of course doesn't cover the entirety of the Rec 2020 color space. As for gaming with HDR enabled then, I have to say this is a really good experience, despite this being a very entry level HDR monitor. We already mentioned how the contrast ratio with local dimming enabled is miles ahead of anything you'd get from an edge lit solution, and with a peak brightness of over 1600 nits, it is eye searingly bright, something that even the best OLED monitors can't match. Of course, 576 dimming zones isn't a ton, so you may notice just some haloing or blooming, particularly around bright highlights in darker overall scenes, but this really can't be helped. You'd need per pixel dimming light from an OLED to avoid this completely. Even then though, I still have to say the experience overall is very, very good, especially for the price, which only makes me more disappointed that the response times are so slow. Wrapping up this review then, it has been a very interesting couple of weeks testing the Cooler Master GP2711 and I have to say this monitor has given me real hope that we are not far off from getting an all round gaming monitor with proper HDR functionality at an affordable price. Unfortunately, I don't think we are quite there yet, at least not when talking about the GP2711 specifically. As good as the HDR is with its 576 dimming zones at a price of just £380 here in the UK, it is simply let down for gaming by its poor response times. The VA panel used is just too slow by modern standards, with noticeable dark level smearing even when using an aggressive overdrive mode, and that just results in very disappointing overall levels of motion clarity. I really do find this to be a real shame, as otherwise Cooler Master has done a very good job with the GP2711. It gets impressively bright, contrast ratio from the VA panel is impressive, factory calibration is also decent, and I really like the overall design. As it is though, I can only see this monitor appealing to a very small niche of people who are happy to live with the poor motion clarity in exchange for the HDR performance. For the vast majority of people though, I really do think that the poor response times and just notable amounts of smearing will be enough of a deal breaker to rule out a purchase of the GP2711. And I have to say, I couldn't blame you at all if that was the case. Anyway guys, that is where I'm gonna leave this review. So if you liked it, please do toss me a thumbs up and as always, let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. If you haven't already, please subscribe and ding that notification bell so you don't miss when we upload a new video. And if you want to carry on the conversation, you can find an invite link to our Discord server in the description. While you're there, you'll also find a link to our merch store where you can consider helping us out by buying one of our new tees. And finally, if you're feeling particularly generous, you can also consider backing us on Patreon. That's it for this one though, guys. I'm Dominic for Kit Guru, and I'll see you in the next video.